today is really just a, a brief overview of DISC, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about each primary style so that you understand the difference uh, between the different styles, and then how you can use DISC for yourself to understand yourself and your own communication style, how you prefer to interact with people, uh, notably, and then also a little bit of insight into uh, how you might be able to understand who you have across the room from you or across the table from you. I think one of the most valuable uh, insights that DISC gives you is not only how we as individuals prefer to interact and communicate with people, but also some understanding that if someone might be, to put it plainly, driving us crazy, it's not that they want to drive us crazy, it's that they need different things from their communication. And once you understand that, you can change the vocabulary of how you interact with them and resolve issues before they become conflict. So we use this heavily with teams and particularly with dysfunctional teams. Um, and I guess Chris mentioned it earlier, but our, there's a number of different vendor providers for DISC assessments. We use one that comes from TTI. They're based out of Arizona. Uh, we evaluated a number of different vendor partners before we selected TTI, and we really did it for the quality of the data and the reporting. And as Chris can attest, uh, it's pretty thorough. Um, I've been out to their facilities in Arizona. I certified through them on site, and they're a fantastic organization. Highly recommend. So if this is something that you're interested Agreed. in. Agreed. Yeah, just phenomenal. And so just as a partner, so like just a wonderful organization to work with. We, we love them and talk to them weekly. Um, let me just, I'm a little slow with the, with the slide changes on this laptop for some reason. So bear with me. Okay. How do you want questions handled? Um, well, I can't see anybody at the moment. So if questions come through the chat, if you don't mind jumping in and just asking them, but if people want to pop off mute and just ask me a question, I'm fine with that too. Um, so just very briefly, what a DISC assessment is and isn't. So the DISC assessment is essentially a measurement of observable behavior. So it will, it's a self-evaluation. You complete the questions on your own and it asks you questions in terms of how you tend to react in certain situations or how you are perceived by others in certain situations, at least for this particular instrument. And it, it gives you information back on how you tend to react or approach certain situations and why you might do that. So it's really about understanding how you prefer to communicate. It doesn't mean that you always communicate that way. What the assessment does not cover is anything that's related to how smart someone is, whether or not they're motivated, what skills or experience or knowledge that they have or don't have, or what their training needs might B or might be, you know, what training they've gone through. So it is really just purely about behaviors and how people show up um, in work and in life. Um, DISC is based on a psychological theory that uh, was developed through uh, a gentleman called Mr. Marston. And it is the universal language of observable behavior. And it's based on four styles. The first one is dominance which is how we talk about how you respond to problems and challenges. Influencing, how you influence others to your point of view or persuasion. Steadiness is how you respond to the pace of the environment around you. And compliance is how you respond to the rules and procedures that are set by others. Um, as far as understanding DISC, each of the styles has a certain kind of behavior that is most commonly associated with it. And with the instrument that we use, we measure each style both as a high value and as a low value. And this is different from other instruments that you might find on the market. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about both of them. And then when I give you some examples, I'll just focus on when we see high values of each style because it is a little bit easier to observe. And it's also more common that you will see someone who has a high value as their dominant style as opposed to someone who has a low value as their dominant style. And I can talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, first of all, in terms of dominance, again, we said before that this, the behavior is about how you respond to problems and challenges. And regardless of where you sit on your D score or any of these scores, your, uh, it will influence how you choose to, to respond or solve problems. Someone who is a high D, what you tend to see from an emotional response or a behavioral response is they tend to be very impatient. 
These are the people who are moving from one thing to another very quickly. They don't tend to stop and look around. Uh, they, they tend to focus on how to get things done, perhaps with less attention to the details of how that actually happens. Someone who is a low D is someone who is typically much more patient will tend to be more reflective in their working style. They are typically folks that will wait and see what comes in listening to other people and uh, will tend to solve problems that way. Um, with each style, there's also um, something that can trigger a fear response and each style is a little different. For dominance, the, the thing that people with a high D tend to worry about is the fear of being taken advantage of. They do not like someone who takes them for a ride. It's one of these once bitten twice shy things. Um, and it, it will play into how they interact with people and how they work with people who they may not have an established relationship with. Moving on to influencing. So influencing, we said previously, is about how you influence others to your point of view. So the social persuasion uh, of, influ of individuals and groups. Someone who is a high I is someone who is typically very optimistic. This is the person who comes into a networking room and they own it. And I'm sure you, as I'm saying this, you, you're going to think of people that you know. They are always upbeat. They know everybody in the room. They are great at connecting people. They, they pride themselves on the social equity and the social recognition that they bring into personal and professional situations. They are the consummate networkers. Uh, someone who is a low eye is someone who is naturally skeptical. So they don't, whereas the high eye gives everyone the benefit of the doubt, the low eye is someone where you kind of got to earn your way in. They naturally kind of hang back. They're going to watch and see what people do. They're, you know, kind of like, all right, I'm not sure, or, you know, I don't trust people until I trust people kind of thing. Um, someone who has a high eye, their principal concern or fear is the loss of social recognition. And the way we often see this play out in the workplace is someone who's a high eye, it's not necessarily about always getting the recognition, but if there is a change where there is a perceived change of status or recognition among a group, or where there is a situation where there was someone who was perhaps promoted out of a group of peers and the person who was not promoted was perhaps a very high I, managing that communication process so that they don't feel slighted is something that, that needs to be managed. Um, so it, it's all about sort of the, the social equity in the room and the recognition also from a connection point of view that they're the go-to person. Like they're the person who's gonna be able to connect to, you know, a number of people together and can do that really, really effectively. And that's important to them as far as their, their self, uh, self perception and value. Uh, steadiness is the next one. This is all about how you respond to the pace of the environment around you. Um, someone who is a high, uh, a high S is the person you never want to play poker with. These are the people who they come into a room and they're typically very non-expressive, neutral body language, neutral face. They are, you know, if you see a duck swim on a pond and it's all very smooth and underneath the feet are paddling really, really quickly, but you never know it. They, they manage issues with a grace that no other dominant style exhibits. They just kind of ride it. Doesn't mean that they're not internalizing what's going on, but they are typically not expressive on the outside. So these are, these are the guys, they're the poker faces. Uh, someone who's a low S is someone who's typically much more expressive. So lots of body language, lots of physical cues, lots of tone of voice changes, intonations. Uh, you can usually recognize a high S and a low S based on what kind of physical feedback they're giving you in your communication. For someone who's a high S, their typical concerning point or fear factor is the loss of security. So they're worried about, uh, and, and I tend to speak in terms of change issues, is they tend to worry about 
the safety control factor of change. So if we're coming in with something that's fundamentally changing someone's job, these are the guys who are going to want to know, all right, what exactly are you asking me to change? Give me the time and the space to understand that and absorb that and figure out what it means for me so that I know if I'm able to do it or not. So that, that security is very, very important to that. And lastly, we have the C's or compliance, which is how, how someone responds to the rules and procedures that are set by others. Someone who's a high C is typically someone who's very cautious, plan the work, work the plan. They tend to look at the facts and understand what the set of compliance framework is that's going on around it and make sure that they are following the approach step by step so that it happens the most efficiently and effectively, uh, effective way possible. On the other side of that, someone who's a very low C is someone who's typically much more freewheeling, uninhibited, don't tend to like to follow the rules. Uh, these are the folks who um, oftentimes are entrepreneurial. Uh, sometimes they take it to an extreme where the rules were made to be broken. So a lot of different kinds of thought patterns, um, which can be good, but can also be uh, challenging in an environment where you do need a certain amount of compliance to keep the train on the track, so to speak. Um, someone who's a high C, their concern as far as fear factor is all about making mistakes. So these are the folks who are very concerned about, for example, if you've got folks who are high C in a regulatory environment, these are the ones who are making sure that you're, you're getting through those audits in a way that is rigorous, thoughtful, careful, procedural, and, you know, ties it all up with a bow. Um, highly valuable um, in organizations where um, you need that kind of compliance and, and regulatory environment. Does anyone have any questions on this before I move on? No? Okay. I think we're all good. You, you might just want to take our higher um, view start. I know you, you jumped in right away with the meat of it, but um, maybe um, go into a little bit of, of the why, the why behind the what of knowing DISC. So, why do we care about understanding the people who are around us? And I think it starts with why do we want to know more about our own communication styles? I can tell you, it, it, for us, we use it because we can't get the best out of the people that we work with without having some sort of an understanding of how they're showing up. So if I have someone uh, for, you know, if I'm working with a CFO, for example, which is one of our projects at the moment, and if I understand how he prefers to receive information, I can adjust my communication to meet him there. And for us, because we are often working on projects where we are pushing through difficult change, and in the last 12 weeks, some really difficult change, understanding the people we have across the table from us is really important because you can lose them. And I know you guys are here for sales training. If you're talking to a prospect and you understand or you get some sort of visual or verbal verbal cues that gives you an indication of what their preferred communication style is and you're able to adjust your own communication style to meet them at least partly in the middle, you will retain their attention longer. You will be able to communicate the content more effectively, recognizing that oftentimes it's not what we say, but how we say it that gets through to someone. And your results will just be better. And the results will be better because you're establishing a more authentic relationship because you care about the person you have across from you. At the end of the day, it's all about, I care enough about you to try to understand what you're looking for so that I can deliver that for you and give it to you in a way that is going to be the most meaningful for you. And so it, is, it, it creates a foundation for a relationship that can grow from there. The other reason why I, I absolutely love DISC and, and a lot of these assessments is if you have a situation where you are in conflict with someone that you're working with, this fundamentally changes the vocabulary that you use to address this. Whereas previously, and I can think back, you know, in my 
career history to before I knew anything about any of this stuff. You know, I would have these conversations with people like, this guy's driving me absolutely crazy. All he does is he gives me all these details and it's just, he goes on and on. And, and now I can have a conversation that says, listen, I understand that you need to be giving me these details. I'm really struggling to maintain focus because I don't naturally tune into the level of detail that you want to give me. Can you give it to me in bullet points? And they're like, okay. Because it, it's not about a personal reaction to someone and who they are. It's about how they're communicating to me and what I need to be able to make the decision that they're asking me to make. Whatever it is. Um, DISC is something that it, it, can, it can set you free in your communications. Because if you understand, just, just, just understanding yourself and how you show up and giving yourself permission to uh, work within your own preferred communication style and acknowledging that, you don't have to be anyone else but who you are. But being able to communicate, this is, this is who I am and this is how I show up, is, is a, fantastic, uh, a fantastic thing to know about yourself. Just full stop. Does that answer your question, Chris? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Um, and yes, I do recognize I sort of jumped into this a little fast. Um, just to sort of, I want to give you guys just an overview of how we, uh, how we identify someone's normal behavioral style. Uh, for the instrument that we use, we, uh, I mentioned before, we measure both the highs and the lows. Uh, typically, whatever we're measuring is the primary style is the measurement that is the furthest away from the 50% water line or the energy line. For some people, they say in the database that it's about 30%. In our experience, it's been less than that. But uh, for a certain portion of the population, their dominant style is actually the low measure or below the energy line. Uh, below the energy line is actually their dominant function. So I'm sorry, Jennifer, how does that make if, if something is low, like in this example, where mm -hmm. you're saying that compliance is a seven, how is that a dominant? So in, in this particular example, it's not, it's the same. Oh. Theory, but what we do get for, in our experience, it's been about, it's closer to 20% of the time where the, the primary style is a low value. So I'll give the example of a low D because I've had this one where the primary style, so the measurement for the D, for example, was seven. Okay. And every other measurement was closer to the energy line. And in that case, the dominant style was something that was much more reflective. So it was someone who is, is really how they show up. And the thing that you notice first about them when, they're, when you're working with them is they have an incredible ability to be patient with other people, to listen before they speak, to give other people in the room the opportunity to be heard. And then with the other styles that they also bring into play, in this particular case, are able to gather that information and consolidate it in a fairly data-driven approach and then present it as a set of solution in a, in a highly collaborative way. So, but the way they show up is someone who's basically they're, they are never the first person to speak in a room. So essentially, if, you're, if your primary style, and not to go down a rabbit hole, but if your primary style is that far below the energy yeah. line, essentially the other three styles are very even keeled near the energy line. There's not like another swinging. Uh, not necessarily. So what we can see is where the dominant style is, is the furthest away. But then the secondary style, you know, you can have someone who's a D7 and then their I is 80, right? Okay. And so they're very much someone who connects people, but they're great at listening. When they walk into a networking room, what you're likely to see is someone who listens first and asks a lot of questions and doesn't necessarily drive the pace of the conversation, but is great is still someone who is very well known for you know gives everyone the benefit of the doubt works a room but works it in a way that is different from is from someone who is perhaps a high d high i cool some d's can drive a conversation with questions i found sorry 
some Ds can drive a conversation with questions. Sure, of course, of course. Um, but what you're going to see with Ds is that the with a high D is someone who is going to have those questions ready to go. Yep. And it's very, um, I don't want to use the term purpose-driven because there's other styles that are also very purpose-driven. Um, it's just, it's more that it is time delimited with a high D. So representing the Ds 100% absolutely, we're going somewhere and I'm just trying to get us there. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's essentially how it, uh, how it shows up. And um, as someone who's also very high D, uh, yeah, it's, um, there's always a reason. So um, does everybody here know their disc profile? I'm okay, so this one is just basically explaining that. For each Let me just ask that question again. Does everybody here know their disc profile? Just, I don't want anyone to get lost here. If you don't know your disc profile, raise your hand. Sorry, you don't know yours? Okay, sorry, you're probably an SI if I was to guess. Anybody else not know theirs? Am I, am I an SI, Chris? Yes, so. definitely. Uh, you might just you might be an IS. Sorry, Jen, uh, Jennifer. An IS. Okay. I used to know it. I used to know it. Renee, say that again. Mine says I'm a 94 I. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. I just want I just didn't want you to lose anyone. Keep going, Jennifer. I'm sorry. No, that's absolutely fine. And if anyone has questions about this afterwards, we can we can take it offline and and figure it out. And if anybody wants to be tested, I'm sure Jennifer can do that too. For a charge. Yeah. <laughs> we can work that out. Uh, so just uh, to sort of categorize how each style plays out, Ds and Cs are more focused on tasks and activities. I and S are focused on people. And I'll just add to it, D's and I's are, tend to be more fast paced. S's and C's tend to take a little more time, just to sort of balance that out. Mm -hmm. Now, in the instrument that we use and the one that Chris has used with me previously, uh, we present the natural style and the adapted style in the results. And the natural style is there's different sets of questions that ask the questions a little bit different ways and the outcome of it is one graph which is talking about the not your you in your most natural state or the real you it's this it is the graph that changes the least it can change a little bit but they say that disc is you know supposedly cradle to grave once you know what your preferred communication style is your preferred behaviors uh, it can, I have seen it change with people after significant life events. So one example that I use quite frequently is we worked with someone who had a fairly significant change on their natural graph following the birth of their first child. So all of a sudden the way that they behaved and the way that they adjusted their whole life moving from someone who was just, you know, working full time and married, whatever. And then all of a sudden had a kid and was like, oh yeah, like C popped up. I need to be more, you know, more structured. This is what we're doing. And so we saw a change in, in her graph. Um, for most mine, changed, people, mine changed after my divorce, S creeped in and it's still there and it's still growing for some reason. It's annoying. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, why not? It, and it's not annoying. It's just give yourself the pay, you know, give yourself the time in this space to evaluate, right? Um, S is not a bad thing. I, I know. It's a good thing. I was teasing. It's a good thing. Um, so in this particular case, for this example, there is a little bit of a difference between the natural and the adapted. It's not significant. We only look at changes that are 10 points or greater between the natural and the adapted. The adapted represents how people change their behaviors to the environment that they're in. It is most often an adaptation that happens in the workplace, though not always the case. Sometimes people will feel the need to adapt uh, for home. Uh, so if we see there's if we 
see a significant difference between natural and adapted, if I'm doing a debrief, I will stop and we will spend some time on this. Because if I'm seeing substantial differences from one to the other, it's usually the indication of a stress trigger and I wanna understand why. And so we'll spend some time understanding what's happened. Has there been a job change, a boss change, you know, something that's uh, provoked the, the change in how someone's showing up versus how they would prefer to show up. And then we'll, we'll look at what are the ways that we can change that so we can bring someone back a little closer to their natural state. Um, if someone is significantly different from one to the other, it, 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 can, be, it can be disconcerting for someone and, and deeply uncomfortable. Um, I have seen graphs where there's fundamental differences from one to the other, and, and it's, it's a significant stress in their work life. Does anyone have any questions on this before I move on? Okay. So I think on the next slides, if I can, there we go. Whoops, I jumped ahead. So what I wanted to do now is just spend a little bit of time, and these come out of real reports. For people. So I actually went into our database and pulled out examples of, uh, of people who represent each of these. And I tried to keep it to folks where it was just high D. So it wasn't like D over I or D over C, where you have both as primary and secondary over the energy line. Um, to give you an idea of how these people want to be communicated with and some of the things you are likely to see from someone who has these, um, who has these um, dominant styles. So first of all, high D. Uh, if you are working with a high D, be brief, be bold, be gone, is what's written on my little Legos. Um, it is all about uh, uh, keeping the communication succinct, not having lots of interruptions, being specific, sticking to business. These are not the people who want to spend 20 minutes on rapport building exercises. One or two questions max, and then you can move into business. And in fact, for many of them, if they're really high D, you don't need to talk about anything personal. It's all good. That doesn't mean they don't like you. They're just like, okay, what, what are we here to do? It is <laughs> um, ways not to communicate. Um, they don't necessarily want you coming with a pre-cooked solution that you expect them to just adopt. So this can be interesting if you are supervising someone who is a very high day, they do not want their solutions piecemeal to them. They need to own part of that decision-making process. They tend to come across as a little bit cocky. So don't be put off by that. They don't mean to be cocky, they're just, very specific, precise, and directive. And they're happy to be challenged on it. They don't, they're, they're not gonna take it personally. So if you don't agree to them, say like, yeah, I think we need to talk about this, I don't agree. And they'll be fine with it. Um, they don't tend to, to get you know, overly worked up about stuff. It's just, all right, let's find a solution and move on. Um, don't dictate to them, don't be redundant, don't ramble, don't repeat. Uh, please don't repeat things over and over again because you will lose them, they check out. They might still be giving you the visual cues because they tend to be good at it, but they are thinking about something else and they have moved on and you will not get them back. You're laughing, Chris. <laughs> um, and I think, I just want to check something here quickly if I minimize the audience. Yeah, so this is actually comes out of my report. So this, um, I used myself for this one, so for what it's worth. Um, very much um, all about keeping it, keeping it on point. And I will move on to I. Okay, hi eyes. So folks who are high eyes, remember we talked about these people are the ones who are all about the social connectivity and building the relationships. They want a warm, friendly, open, fun environment in work and in life. They want um, a connection. They're looking for that connection. So if you are working with someone who is a high I and you are trying to work on a project or whatever it is, there's a few things. 
you can read their body language so you'll know exactly what they're thinking they don't tend to uh, hide their emotions in any way nor do they feel the need to so you will know where you stand with someone and this is great it's great feedback for you uh, not necessarily the folks who you want to provide lots of opinions or options to because you may find that you can go down a rabbit hole and lose a lot of time and it'll be very hard to get them back on track so provide a certain amount of structure if you're looking to get stuff done provide it in you can still be fun loving and open but give them the structure follow up stuff in writing so if you talk about something in a phone call and i, I work with someone who's a very high eye and we found that this has become very necessary because otherwise nothing gets done is i have to follow up stuff in writing and provide a certain structure and guidance so that we know where we're going next um, but they also want to make sure that there's a certain amount of time for socializing so when you're starting off the meeting, if you're doing a one-on-one -on -one with someone, you know, do spend that, you know, 10 minutes or so, you know, riffing a little bit. So, you know, talk a little bit about what's going on in their lives, make sure that you're spending some time talking about their personal life because it's something that's very important to them. Um, don't uh, uh, try to over control the situation. Don't leave decisions hanging in the air. Uh, don't let them drive the pace of the conversation if you are under time constraints. These are the folks who, if you are doing a one hour one-on-one -on -one, or you have one hour book to do a sales presentation, you could wind up in the room for two hours and never get to the point of your meeting. So if you recognize that you've got an eye, give yourself permission to set up, you know, that upfront contract in the beginning of the meeting is just say, all right, I know we have an hour for this conversation. I wanna make sure that we hit all of our goals. Is that okay with you? And they'll be okay with it. You just need to set it up up front. Um, does anyone have any questions on high eyes before I move on? Okay. And so oh. I, I just want to point out one thing, just so you guys know, there is no right or wrong to any disc profile. It's just who you are. And it's, this is about learning how to work with others, knowing who you are. So there's no right or wrong answer. There's no good or bad or anything like that. Just wanted to point that out. And let me just add, because you're 150% right, Chris. Um, we, we run a lot of these and we've literally seen very, very successful CEOs who are all of these. So I often get the question from people where they're like, oh, you know, only high Ds can be successful CEOs. Totally not true. Totally not true. And some of the most successful businesses that we've worked with in the last few years have had leaders that are all over the place. Um, and we recently worked with an organization that was led by, there were three people on the leadership team um, and they represented three very distinctly different disc profiles. And it was, it was absolutely fascinating to watch them make decisions as a team. Um, I am a huge fan of diversity of thought. And this is one way by having different communication styles in a team, you get a much better result if you have diversity of thought across a group of leaders. And I'll talk a little bit about a little more about that as we get to the back end of this presentation. Moving on, if my screen decides to change. Okay, hi S. So hi S, we talked about that these are the folks who uh, respond, or they're, they're sort of the non-expressive poker faces of the world. So they tend to respond to the environment around them and they, they set a pace that gives them the space and the time to evaluate things. Um, when you have someone across from you who is a high S, they will tend to look for a, some sort of an icebreaker. So they may not necessarily offer it first, but they, they might, and it'll be something to introduce you on a personal as opposed to a professional level. So these are the folks they might ask about your kids. They might talk about what's going on. It could be anything from the weather to sports to whatever it is, but they want to start that conversation on a personal level first. Um, they are looking for a certain amount of precision. Uh, they want yes or no answers. They want specifics. 
they want uh, they want solutions to problems. They do not necessarily, in, you know, contrary to a high eye, are not necessarily looking for a, a brainstorming conversation in every conversation. They're more likely looking for someone to come in with a thoughtful, analytical solution. Hand. Um, still, these are the folks who are typically perceived as very friendly, very you know, a little maybe a little more laid back than a, than a high eye, but someone who is very approachable, someone who people will reach out to proactively because they are perceived as someone who uh, is available, who is open to um, conversation, consultation, advice, mentoring, coaching. Um, these are the folks who, who naturally present themselves this way. Um, ways not to communicate with a high S is um, what our SDs tend to do de facto. So we need to be very mindful of this when we're working with a high S is don't come in with a pre-cooked bullet point agenda that runs through things in 10 steps or less and gets done with the meeting in 25 minutes. It's not how they operate. Uh, they, it, it's something that will put them on their back foot because it's not giving them enough time to, um, to build the environment that allows them to absorb what they need to absorb and make the decisions that they need. Um, they, if you are looking to, if you're working with someone who's in a leadership position, who is a high S and you're coming in with a proposed change, you better have your facts lined up. They're going to want to know if you're telling me that we're not going to do this, you better explain to me the what, the how, and the why, and you better have not just, you know, invented it. You better show me that you've actually done the work to demonstrate that there's, there's a case for it. So bringing a case for change, if I relate it back to the work that we do, when we're working with high S's and we're looking to move them through a change, we need to show what the case is. It, it's a business case. And we come in and we need to know um, what it is and explain to them and still do it in a way that brings them along for the ride. So it's not something where we're just bombarding with facts, we're doing it in a way that tells more of a, I guess, tells more of a story, um, if I could put it that way. Does anyone have any questions on that? Does it resonate with anybody? A little bit. All right. I'm going to move on. Um, high C. So C's are all about compliance. So how they react to the environment around them and the rules that are set by others. Um, someone who is a high C is um, these are the guys who want the facts. So my typical example are the folks that are working, uh, for example, in financial roles. And I use this example because we're working with a bunch of finance guys at the moment. Uh, and it is like, this is what we can do and this is what we can't do. And these are the rules that are set and here's the data to support it. And they, if we come with a change, we need to make sure that we've allocated enough time for them to ask very fact data-based questions that satisfy their need to understand that we are doing it the right way and we have planned it and we are gonna work the plan that we planned. Um, so they like organized presentations with structure that shows the depth of understanding in the data that supports the findings. They like schedules, they like accuracy, they like reliability. Uh, they want to know that you've put in the work to demonstrate what it is that you're asking them to do. Ways not to communicate. These are not the folks that you want to say, don't worry about it, just trust me, we got this, because that's not how they operate. They want to know that there is something going on, there is something behind it, and that we're doing it the right way. We don't want to rush the decision-making process with a high C. You want to give them the space. So typically, if you are presenting someone with, uh, for example, you, um, their prospect and you're in a sales meeting, do not expect them to make the decision right there in the room. Give them the opportunity to take a couple of days to think about it, and then they can come back and give you an answer. You, they're, they're happy with a deadline, but they're going to want a couple of days. So typically, what we'll do in this case will be, look, I'm going to send you over a deck to look at. We're going to talk through the deck. Uh, we're going to answer whatever questions you have. Let me know if you have follow-up questions. I'm going to call you back two days later and I, you know, I'll need some feedback and that could be yes or no, but we'll be looking for some feedback so we know how to move forward or not. 
Uh, they don't like a lot of confrontation. So be mindful of that if you are working with a group of people where um, there might be some change going on and there is naturally a tendency for conflict in any change. So give everyone the opportunity to voice opinions, um, to present a case for data, but don't provoke some sort of a conflict that needs to be resolved right there in the room at that time. Um, they do not like haphazard anything, so use your structure. Again, this is all about planning work and working the plan. Is there any questions on this? No? Okay. I, Jennifer, I actually have a question because you're talking about conflict. Um, and, and it could just be a personal thing. I'm, I believe I'm a high C, um, but I am like very quick to get into conflict and like resolve. Is that just because there's other elements in my personality or other elements in my disc profile that are dominating based on a situation? I'm not sure. Uh, I'd have to sort of look at what it was that was playing in it. There could be a couple things playing in and it could be, it could be contextual based on the situation that you're in uh, and playing into one of your motivators where perhaps you're more apt to drive something because there is something going on that's not directly related to observable behavior, but more okay. about how you choose what, what motivates you as how you communicate with others. Um, you might be a DC. Um, I don't know. I, I'd have to, I'd have to go through the process of doing an evaluation. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying for me in particular, I guess it's more just when I, when I've seen conflicting, um, or not, it's not conflicting when I've seen, um, highs and lows in some of these, um, profile behaviors. Like when I think about some of my clients and I'm like, oh, this person's a, a, a D, they're a D, they're a D. And then I'll hear something else. And I'm like, oh wait, maybe they're not a D. <laughs> and so I'm trying to yeah, pull takes, out. Yeah, it takes a little time and practice. And keep in mind that you may have someone who um, they could be D and I, both above the energy line. So you'll see components of both styles um, as you speak with them. So it's not just going to be, and, and I picked examples that were, there was really one dominant Right. Um, dominant traits so that I could give you examples coming out of the reports that were a little cleaner than if you had a very blended kind of profile. Thank you. And I'll tell you in the business world, a DI or an ID is very common, especially uh, the networking types, I, I find. And when in doubt, when I'm not sure what someone is, and Jennifer, you'll back me up or not, you'll tell me if I'm right or wrong but they're generally uh, pretty high in the S quadrant. They're the hardest to read. You just have to, they have a, yeah, it's poker face. If you're not getting the body language uh, feedback, chances are they're an S or have some S in there. Okay, keep going. Great. Um, now what I wanted to do next was just spend a little time looking at some examples. I can get this to work. Okay, so these are real people who I pulled out of our data bank and I wanted to spend a little time looking at each graph and talking about how you think they might communicate together. What do you think would work and what do you think would not work between each of their profiles? Just to have a little bit of fun with this because the real value in DISC, as we said in the beginning, is understanding ourselves but also understanding who we have across from each other. So does someone want to take a guess how these two people might communicate? Or do we think that they would communicate successfully? I'll give someone else a chance to go first. Anybody want to take a shot at this? I will. Um, Cause I'm so fascinated by it. Um, yeah. So I, am I analyzing how they're speaking to each other or just who they are as an individual? Yeah, so how, how are they going to get along? Yeah. Okay. So the I, uh, the one, the profile on the left is a very high I, a little bit 
a lot of body language, a lot of outward projection of who they are. And if they're speaking to the other profile, that's a high C, that person may be uh, more reserved and just not wanting to hear all the fluff and the adjectives that the I is using. So the I person should probably uh, pick up on the, the C's body language um, in order to be more, uh, I guess, uh, like when that, when that person or that client or that conversation over, they may wanna try mimicking that C person a little more because I believe an I, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, an I is more likely to mimic than a C or has more capability to, or am I making an assumption? Uh, depends on the person. Can I take a shot? Yeah, sure. So this is a complete mismatch. It's not gonna work because the C is gonna bore the crap out of the I and the I is gonna make the C crazy because they're mm -hmm. all over the place. But with all of that said, because the C also has high enough S in them and the C is probably pretty bright, they will adapt more so than the I. The I can't, the I is who they are regardless. Um, so the C is gonna be the one mirroring the I more so would be my guess. But it's a temporary relationship. It is not, these are not best friends or a couple. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> I can speak first. Right, anyone I'm else? A, I'm, a, I'm a CS, and uh, I know when I'm talking with I, and uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to um, control the conversation and make sure it ends at the appropriate time. And they just go all over the place, and I'm just trying to figure out how to come down. Um, all right. So what I will say, without going into the personal details of the two people who are on this, um, they, they, they know each other quite well. They, they get along very well. What they rely on is what they have in common, which is the high S. So they give each other the space and the time to talk about things, to work through things, to communicate together and, and spend that time to do that. And then they give each other the space and they, they, they give each other the space to do their, their work in the ways that make, that satisfy each other needs differently. So they, they come together for when they need to come together. And then the I goes off and does their thing where they're off talking to everyone. And the C goes off and does their thing and does the analysis and data. And, and it works together very, very well. Um, and, and these two people have known each other for a very long time. Successful. Are they married? They are. Interesting. Yeah. So for how long? A long time. <laughs> I wish. Essentially, we should. It, it's. It would be great practice to find what your mat or what your what what disc you have in common. Oh, I guess, but not everyone has any disc. Like, there's a chance that they have. So the thing is, is that it, it's one thing when you've got uh, an like an easy where you can make. Um, you're seeing some observable behavior that you can make an interpretation on, which, you know, in many cases is the high D or the high I, where you're seeing it because you're getting more visual cues. Um, and again, it, oftentimes it comes over time, right? You learn to appreciate other people the more time you spend with them. I mean, we've been working with this tool for a few years now, we still every six months will sit down as a team and spend several hours going through profiles and talking about how we show up and what we need to remind each other. And all of, like and like everyone has a coffee cup when they start that has their their disc profile on it, their driving forces and their Myers Briggs type. And we like walk around with it like I need this. Like this is this is me. Like thanks. <laughs> And it, it just makes it a little easier to, to remember stuff. Do you have uh, more of these that you can show us? I do. Yeah, I do. Do another. This is a great exercise. It's fun, isn't it? Told you I could do this all day long. All right, how about these two? 
Oh, I got this, but I'll let somebody else go first. All right, I'll jump. Nobody else wants to? Oh, you, they're going to clobber each other. That's right. They're going to be ultra competitive <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yep. Okay. Because then they can grow each other's strengths, no? They're just going to be, it may be a good thing, it may be a bad thing, that's not, the, but it's just going to be constant competitiveness, trying to one-up each other, which is a way of growing, sure. Yeah. I mean, this is it's me and my father every day. It's also exhausting. <laughs> it is exhausting. <laughs> so for these two people, again, they know each other very well, uh, have known each other for several years. They're not a couple. They do work together. They, they work together very well. There is a certain amount of competitiveness, but not as much as you might think because the job roles are a little different. Um, what's interesting here is there's a little, there's a risk and it has happened where because the disc profiles are so similar, they go down rabbit holes and they make decisions without having, without, without balanced analytical data behind it. Because mm -hmm. they're deep. Yeah, you get, you get a bit of group think. Mm. And I will tell you that I'm one of them. One of them is my profile. So one of these, so one of these is you? One of these is me. So you're the one on the... Right. Yeah. I'm on the right. Interesting. Very low S with me. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, the risk factor there is like, it's like, oh yeah, let's do that. Okay, we just do that. And, and then we do that, and then all of a sudden it's like, why the hell did you guys do that? Oh, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, so, yeah. Oh, so, <laughs> you can, can you feel how that would happen? Huh? <laughs> can you see how that would happen? <laughs> done, done is better than right is our motto, right? It's just, oh, okay, I guess we'll do something different. Um, okay. Good. Give us another. I think I have enough, one more. I had more, but I wasn't sure. I figured we'd be here all day if I put too many in. All right. Uh, Ooh. Wait, wait, we'll go back one. Go back one, yeah, I wanna know what this yeah. one. That one's a different one, the last one's a different one. So these huh? are, this is the next one. How about these two? They're fine, they're just gonna talk all day. <laughs> um, yeah, they, they're matched really well, actually. So this again is two people who work together or work together. I don't think they work together anymore. They didn't work together for a super long period of time. Again, yes, it was a very kind of friendly collegial. They weren't in similar job roles, but it wasn't a super large organization. So they were in contact fairly regularly. Um, they're, they got along until things kind of shifted and then it was like a little bit, you know, the, the profile on the left tended to move a little fast as far as the pace and the profile on the right at a certain point didn't appreciate all of the sort of rat tat tat communications in an open space environment. So it created a little bit of conflict at one point where it was like, I can't handle it anymore. I'm putting on headphones. Stop talking to me. Yep. But when we're at lunch, I'm happy to talk with you all you want, but then I'm going back to work and then you got to leave me alone. Who put on the headphones? The D. Yes, on the right. The D. No, he's Wait. just saying. No. Well, the yeah. person on the right put on the headphones? On the right needed the space to be able to do their stuff. Yeah. Oh, well, that was more to bottle themselves up then. That was a self-discipline of sorts. Yeah. They were putting themselves in timeout. Yeah. They wanted steadiness. They wanted... No, they couldn't, they could not stop engaging. So they had to shut themselves down. So they put on headphones. Hmm. It was a self, 
prescribed. Like the, D, the D wouldn't, wouldn't be able to stop themselves and be like, okay, I'm driving away. I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to drive into silence. He's going to do what the D wants to do. Well, right. They're and gonna, that's why they're going to ignore the IS. But keep in mind that that D is not, a, it's not D alone. It's D. That's right. Okay. So okay. This is, this is kind of a typical kind of sales profile. And this is actually a salesperson. And on the left, on the left. Yeah. And they, um, at a certain point, it was like, all right, you need to go, you know, go somewhere else for a while <laughs> because no work was getting done. Yep. Okay. All right. And then the last one, this is not about two people who I, I, I they don't work together, but I threw two slides up to talk about how would you communicate with each of these people? What are you seeing in each of these graphs? We can start with the person on the left. So what is your question? So how would you, if you met this person, what would you see and how would you communicate with them? So they smile a lot. They look up a lot. I would lead them with questions. Um, that's my answer. What kind of visual cues do you think you'd get? They look up a lot and they smile a lot. Okay. Open body language. Yep. So they're going to look up for their answers and they're going to say something memorable and they're going to smile before they speak and smile probably afterwards to make sure you're okay with what they said. But they're also going to give you a lot of eye contact because they want to. I don't know. Sure. No, you don't think? They, no, because these are looking for the answers. They, there's generally a big wind up and you throw some eye in there too. They, they're going to take a little while to find the, the runway. The C is going to find the, the C is going to take a while. Well, you got, there's high I there too. So they're talkers. Yeah. So in this particular case, and I'm, I'm focusing on the natural style as opposed to the adapted style, this individual is dialing up their C and adapted. They are, they, they're a business owner. And, and most of these I think are, our business owners, but um, they naturally are high I. However, in the adapted style, they're also dialing up their C, which means that you're getting a lot of visual feedback on how they're showing up in the room, but not necessarily, they, they seem to be articulating what they want as far as data but it's, it's, not, it's not all the way there. They're, they're working hard to, to bring that data. So asking, so getting them to articulate, if you're trying to sell to someone like this, getting them to articulate what it is that they want is very hard, very hard. Okay, and the person on the right? And the person on the right, anyone wanna take a guess? Seem pretty balanced. Mm -hmm. they, they, they could be anyone they want to be, right? It depends on the day and the moment and the situation, but they, they've got all the different tools, for lack of a better word, all the different personality traits. It's probably more a matter of who they're paired up against. So this is a very interesting case and one of the most challenging uh, reports that we've done recently. Uh, it's the natural style is what we call tight and tight usually is one of two things. They either don't believe that the assessments for real and they're trying to gain mm -hmm. it or they are trying to be all things to all people. Mm -hmm. and in this case, the individual was most definitely trying to be all things to all people. 
and was working for, uh, was in a, in a very specific role working for a leadership team with some very different and sometimes conflicting management styles. And this individual was running around trying to meet everybody in the middle. Right. And that's what was coming out. Um, the conversation- Surprise their S isn't higher to be actually, to be honest with you. So the conversation, but also a fast moving uh, mid-sized organization that was very profit driven. So like fast was the name of the game. So I was not necessarily surprised that in the adapted, the one thing that really dropped was the S. Um, we had a conversation with this person about their stress levels and where they were at and what it was going to mean and, and, and what they needed to be successful in the job. Um, but yeah, those, when, when it, when you have someone who's very tight across the energy line, it's, uh, usually an indication that something else is going on and you're not typically going to get, you will get as far as observable feedback you get a lot of like conflicting cues. Very hard to get a read on them. Jen, just so you can pace yourself, we got about 20 minutes. Yeah, this is actually my last slide. So okay. I um, so I said before that the TTI is actually offering free work from home reports. If anyone wants one, we can just get one for you. It's uh, the exact same assessment that, so you'll have all the same questions, but what you get is a, a greatly abbreviated report that just explains a little bit about how you prefer to work from home. Um, and it was something that they came out with to support people as, as we all went into lockdown. So if anyone wants that, just let me know. And we can that for you. Um, if anyone wants to talk more about DISC, if they've done a DISC and they're curious about what it means for them, or if they have someone in their life or in their work that you know, is particularly um, challenging. We can certainly have a talk about that. Um, I'm happy to go back and revisit any of these slides if people have other questions for me that they want to talk about or things that have popped up in their work or challenges that they've got. We can, we can do a bit of a dive into that. So I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I'm going to. I mean, I'm sorry, especially because we're recording this, but if somebody wanted a DISC evaluation, maybe for an employee, maybe for a child, whatever it might be, what would you charge them and how would they do that with you? So we, we work with the reports. It depends a little bit on what someone wants. Typically the most common report that we run is a trimetrics, which is a three science report that is disc driving forces. And then either we do competencies, which are soft skills, or we do emotional intelligence. And that we have set pricing that comes from the vendor. The assessments are 150 bucks. And then we do a debrief behind it. And the debriefs typically take 90 minutes. Um, it, it, most of the time when we're doing these, we're doing these for groups or organizations and we're doing it as part of a package process. So, so you know, someone saying, all right, we're gonna use this as part of recruiting and we're doing a job benchmark and there's a certain number of reports that come with it. Um, if people want to know about a disc or they want to run a disc, give me a call and we'll figure it out. Okay. All right. Any questions? Um, I found my disc. What did you think I was, Chris? I, I think you're, you are, uh, appear to be an SI. You may have some C in you. You don't have a lot of D would be my guess. Not that I'm on the spot here, but go ahead. Now you got to tell me if I'm right. Um, if you are. Well, you got to get more than that. Now we got to really milk it. How right am I? I can show it to you. Share your screen. I can stop sharing mine. Do you see it? Bam! Look at that. Very good. Yeah. So you're actually a low D. So remember I said at the beginning that there's a certain amount of the population that um, their primary function is the low value. You're actually a low D. Can you bring that to life a little more? Yeah. yeah. So a low D is someone who's typically more reflective, uh, tends to uh, wait for information or for things to, to come in 
to ask questions, to give people the opportunity to um, share their thoughts before they weigh in. Um, and, and generally, usually what you're seeing first is the other attributes, which is why Chris was saying that he thought there was SC. Um, oh. <laughs> Pete Orvis popped in for a visit. Yeah. Um, and uh, here, if you go to, go to page seven, go to, no, go, move up a little bit. So hold on one sec. Let me just jump in also. Go back to that for one sec. So let me just tell you from a coaching perspective, um, sorry, just to put a positive spin on this as well, that not that anything's negative. Um, you're very stable and nurturing, right? It takes a lot to ruffle your feathers. Um, you're who you are every day. You're also very comfortable being you. You're comfortable in your skin. Um, it does take a little to get you started on stuff. You don't feel ready a lot, if that makes sense. But once you're in it and once you're ready and once you have it figured out, you'll go. But from a coaching perspective, I kind of got to push that boulder a little bit. And once it's going down the hill, it's going to go, if that makes sense. Um, does that work for you, Jennifer? Would you agree with those statements? Yeah. Uh, keep in mind that you know low D just means you're you're going with the time and the space to make the decisions that you want to make. Um, but you're you're going to give yourself that space to do that. But she's still considered a driver. No, no. She's low D. No. Okay. I just didn't know because it was far from the energy line. If that was no. So if you scroll up in the report, if you're okay with it, Sarah, you'll okay. see ways to communicate, and we can look at that. Give her a ballpark page. Um, 16, probably. Time wasters. Adaptive, now keep going. Do your reports look like this? Is this what, are yours page pretty identical? Numbers, our page numbers are a little different because ours are systematically three sciences. What so, am I looking for? Um, Page 16, roughly. Or ways to communicate. There's communication tips. And you you control F and then just put in communication. This is communication. So time and space. You want to ask the questions. You want to know that you've got the space to be able to do things. Um, you know, you, you like the specificity, but you want the time and the space to be able to, to understand what's going on and make the decision that works for you. Okay. Go down any, to other, no. any other questions for Jennifer? You want okay. to leave your contact information, Jen, in the chat? Sure. Okay, thanks. Uh, why don't you put that, can you also put that first screen that you had up, um, back up, please? Me? What do you want me to put? Jennifer. Up? Jennifer, the very first slide you had. Hang on. All right, well, anyway, I, Jennifer, I want to thank you very much for joining us and doing this. It was terrific, um, so thank you. Um, you've been a great friend over the years, and I look forward to seeing more of you. Um, and Maybe I do life. wouldn't that be awesome? Say that again. I miss people. <laughs> okay. Well, we have a community. If you want to join us again, I would be open to that conversation, and we can <laughs> have that. Um, but anyway, so thank you. So what I'd like to do is go around the room. And Jen, we're going to include you in this. I'll go to you last, but do takeaways and aha moments. So Renee, you're in my top left. We're going to start with you. What was your takeaway and your aha moment? Oh, you always do this to me. Um, okay, so my aha moment is that I've got more D than I thought I did. <laughs> um, okay. And um, my takeaway Oh, you have to come back to me on that. All right. So those of us that know you, Sarah and I, because we, we sit with you in meetings, can both vouch. You have a lot of D in you. 
we've seen you get angry before for other people and yeah there's some definite d in you my lack of d you get angry for me yes <laughs> you and sarah would be a good team all right david quick what's your aha and your takeaway uh well i like the perspective of why i'm comfortable with certain people and why I'm Hold on, I'm having a hard time hearing and understanding you. Talk closer to the mic, please. How, how's that? Uh, it sounds like you got water running, but anyway, go for it. Yeah. Well, I I can see now why I'm comfortable with some people and uncomfortable with others, particularly these. Okay. So that's your people. takeaway. What was your aha? Um, that was you know, my aha is understanding that my how my some of my experiences, why uh, certain things happen the way they did. Okay. Well, Melissa, you're up. Um, David, mute yourself. Turn off that waterfall, please. Um, my takeaway and my aha are very similar. The, the exercise where we were looking at the profiles and trying to approach that person, um, very cool, especially because I was trying to not be me, but be that other person as well. Um, and just the, the reminder, Jen, of the practice and that this does take time and you, the fluency in understanding your audience and yourself uh, is an ongoing, an ongoing uh, practice challenge. Okay, Sarah? Sarah. Um, I mean, I guess the takeaway is just how useful of a tool it can be, but you definitely have to, you know, process it in your mind before you can go around and use it. But and well, also you do. <laughs> um, and I guess going back and looking at my own report, it was a it's a cool thing to do. I totally forgot that I had done it. Um, I would be interested to see to take it again though and see if it was the same. But okay. All right, Sandy. Yeah, like, uh, thank you, Chris. Um, that was a fantastic pre presentation, Jen. I learned a lot because I remember the purple disc book. So um, my takeaway is going back to the basics and really understanding it. The aha was through those scenarios, which stumped me. Like I thought I could read them better. So it really is going, the aha is the practice of as we go even on Zoom, the networking groups, to know your audience, to know who you're talking at, and slow down and listen for keys and cues with, the, uh, with contact, with eyes. Even though we're on Zoom, you can still find out who's that D and who's really, you know, that C. So there's a lot to learn and a lot to practice. So thank you. Okay. Jen, any ahas or takeaways for you? So yeah, I, well, I always, so first of all, I really enjoyed doing the exercise with the how, how would these two people communicate? Because I learned from the audience every time I do one of these. And so it was really interesting to hear your feedback of what you guys thought you were going to say, because there were things that maybe I hadn't thought of that, uh, that helped me learn as well. And I learn every time I do one of these debriefs, it doesn't stop. So I'm grateful for that. And I think my takeaway is going to be that um, I want, want to go back and take a second look at it. It's not for the examples I presented here, but there's some stuff that I want to look at as far as how people work effectively with folks who are low on the, um, on the, on the functions and how that manifests with some specific examples. So there you go. All right. So my aha and my takeaway, um, is one, Jennifer, it was great to see you and I, I miss your energy and your passion and, and all of those things. And it's interesting that you have a few people that you know pretty well on here and that you shared some time with. So that was interesting to see. Um, it's also the first time I've shared this talk with someone and um, I was comfortable with it. So that's a takeaway of sorts and an aha. But I do wanna share something that I just, I can't not. Because if I don't tell you guys, I have to call someone and tell them. So, uh, and I, I agreed with everything you said. So this isn't, it's not stepping on your toes. It's adding to the, the talk, if that's okay. Um, that if you want to know who someone is, ask them a question you know the answer to. So it could be something like ask them for directions, even though you know how to get there. 
So, and I learned this from Chip and Sandler, and I'll give him credit for this. So, if you ask a D for directions on how to get somewhere, if you ask me, I'm going to look at you like you don't have ways, you don't have an app that can do that. So, that's a D's response. If you ask and they start giving you very flowery directions, very talking about the trees along the way or the restaurant and the specials on the menu or whatever, or my sister got engaged there, that's an I. If somebody all of a sudden tells you, when you pull in the driveway, I'll flip the light so you know what house it is, or I'll be out on the, the porch and I'll wave so you know where you're going, that's an S, right? That's nurturing. A C is going to know the directions to the tenth of a mile. They're going to know it's seven eighths of a mile. They're not going to say about a mile. They're going to say it's seven eighths of a mile. You take a left. So that's a great way to know who you're talking to. And then you know how to leave them a voicemail, how to send them a quote. D's and C's want the numbers up front. Don't make us look for them. I's and S's like the fluff a little more. Uh, I will make a request representing the D's of the world. If you're going to leave me a voicemail and my fingers hovering over delete all the time, don't make me call, write down a phone number and call you back at a different number. Just call from that number so we can call you back. So that's just my little rant on that. But Jennifer, you did a wonderful job. You're, you're much smarter than I am and you go much deeper and wider on the topic. Um, and thank you. My pleasure. I'm glad I was able to do it. Um, so that's it. Um, next event for us will be Vang on Thursday at four o'clock. You're all invited. I hope you all come. The numbers are growing. Uh, please register. Jennifer, please come. I think you'll enjoy it. Thanks. And um, Sarah and Melissa, I need to have individual conversations with you at some point if either of you are free later today. All right. We'll call it there. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you.